everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. This is uh, the podcast of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. We do that through telling inspiring stories, nurturing multi-faith relationships, and encouraging folks to act together. Uh, tonight's show is really about stories of compassion, forgiveness, and joint action. It is a part of the preparation for Interfaith Week, sponsored by both Holden Village and Path to Understanding. We will have six nights of live webinars starting Sunday, July 19th and ending July 24th. The webinars will include interfaith conversation on the topic of us, them, and all, weaving our identities and common humanity within the unity of life. You will soon be able to register for those live webinars at www.holdenvillage.org. And those webinars will include both three nights of art and also three nights of conversation. So we'll hope you'll join us for those live conversations. But, but tonight we're really excited to have um, four folk on with us. Um, the first is Nina Fernando, who serves as the program director at the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign, a multi-faith coalition of religious denominations and faith-based organizations committed to countering anti-Muslim discrimination and violence in the United States and building a society where all are treated with dignity and respect. She joined Shoulder to Shoulder team in August of 2017. Hi, Nina. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. And then we also have Elise Tagur, who's the co-director of the Faith Action Network here in Washington State. She brings three decades of experience in mission-driven work in human services and advocacy. She's a lifelong resident of Washington State, born and raised in Yakima, and completing undergraduate education at Spokane at Gonzaga University, and making Seattle home since 1980s, including work at Northwest Harvest. Hi, Elise. Hi, so good to be here with all of you. I'm also happy to have with us tonight Race Buyan, who's a peace activist and an IT professional. After graduating from, I'm gonna say this wrong, Silet College? How did I do? Uh, in, in military school in Bangladesh, he joined the Bangladesh Air Force and was commissioned as a pilot officer following two and a half years of vigorous training. In 2001, Race was shot in the face by Mark Stroman, a white supremacist seeking vengeance for the 9-11 tragedy. His time now is divided between managing a team of system engineers and data centers in Europe and touring the globe, giving talks about the regenerative power of forgiveness. Race, thanks for joining us. Well, I'm very happy to be here and uh, glad to be among all the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And then lastly, but not least, we have Shanta Prema Wardhana, the Reverend Doctor, um, who was most recently the Director for Interreligious Dialogue and Cooperation at the World Council of Churches based in Geneva, Switzerland. Shanta is the Director of Omnia Institute for Contextual Leadership. Previously, Shanta served as the Associate General Secretary for Interfaith Relations at the National Council of Churches of Christ based in New York. Shanta, thank you for being here from Chicago. So, you know, you all, this has been a very heavy time for all of us right now. Um, human beings, it seems, have a lot to figure out about how we're going to live with each other. And uh, with, uh, with the, the tragedies, um, among which George Floyd is only one, we're seeing kind of the, the dual uh, original sins of, of America, uh, the way we, the way uh, uh, colonizers treated Native Americans, but also uh, people of color in general. And so um, all of these, these really difficult um, realities are kind of coming to the consciousness of many more people right now. And a, a lot of folk are, are struggling. And of course, Part of the struggle is that the news only um, often shares the bad news. And of course, that's not a knock on journalists. We need journalists more than, more than ever before. But, but sometimes we can get so focused on negative stories that we kind of get overwhelmed. And so tonight's uh, episode is gonna be mostly about positive stories that our panelists have experienced or heard about or witnessed and been part of so that we can recognize that all across this country, there are people who are doing really excellent work in their community with people of other wisdom traditions and, uh, and who are making a difference in their community. And tonight's a, a night to kind of focus on those stories. 
So we never really worked out who was going to go first, but I, I think maybe I'm going to pick on Nina. So Nina, can you share like a story or two of some, some positive, uh, you know, things that folk are doing out there to make a difference in their own community? Sure. So, you know, what felt like a decade ago, uh, but also just so recent, like yesterday, uh, you know, we were hearing about the pandemic and, and the concerns for COVID um, increasing more and more. And, uh, you know, it really uh, turned everything upside down in the way that we, um, ex what, what, and what we expected to do. Um, and, and many of us in our organizations, but um, locally, um, and, and I'll say for myself, I am also pregnant um, expecting my first baby. And, and so that really shifted so much um, for, for me personally, as well as, as in our work. Um, but some, some positive stories, you know, we, we, we heard the measures for social distancing. And so we translated a lot of our programming um, into virtual spaces. And but what we were really, you know, committed to was social distancing or physical distancing does not have to mean social isolation. Um, and so one of the campaigns that we, we do every year over Ramadan is we uplift interfaith iftars or iftars open to interfaith guests around the country uh, to show how Ramadan's an opportunity to get to know your Muslim neighbors. Um, and we couldn't do that this year in, in quite the same way. So what we did was create a niche, an initiative called Welcome to My Table where we paired households to one another so that they can share an iftar meal together and get to know each other on a more intimate level. And the response was amazing. Um, we had um, so many, many different, uh, you know, communities coming together um, in, in different ways on a small level and really beautiful stories from that that I'd be happy to share. That's great. Well, why don't you share one of those right now while, while we kind of understand what you're, where you're going? Sure, um, like a, a you know a fun um, um, household pairing. There were two interfaith couples, uh, young Catholic and Muslim uh, combination, um, and they were in two different uh, parts of the country, and and they felt so connected. Um, they talked about families and and decisions they had to make um, as as a couple, um, and 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 so much more that they even forgot to talk about Ramadan itself <laughs> um, wow. as they were um, celebrating their meal. Um, there was another where two. Two, um, two sets of teenagers um, were discussing and comparing notes with school and video games, which was so great. Um, uh, a New York City-based um, couple paired with um, a couple in Minnesota um, and, and building really strong, um, having, having some really strong uh, connections and conversations. So um, it was really great to, to hear some of that, sharing recipes and deciding upon a recipe before their dinner so that they could share a meal, um, you know, virtually together. So really sweet stories like that. That's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And I wonder, Race, if we could kind of go to you next. Uh, what are some positive stories you've been seeing um, out there about how people are, are crossing interfaith lines to, to do work in their community or to get to know each other? Well, I mean, the, the situation we're living in right now, it, it reminds me of uh, Charles Dickens, uh, the famous quote that it was the best of the time, it was the worst of the time, right? Definitely, we are living in a, in a time that we never imagined that in 2020, we will be facing this kind of, you know, um, uh, tremendous, you know, painful, uh, unexpected, and also uh, health issues, uh, the COVID situation I'm talking about, that we'll be facing something like this in our lifetime. But at the same time, it also um, kept me very hopeful as well, seeing how people are coming together on the street, how people are raising their voice, how people are showing solidarity. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from. That is standing up for humanity. And that really, you know, uh, give me the hope that no matter how challenged our life is today, there is hope for a better tomorrow because people are waking up, people are coming together and they're standing up for, you know, for each other. That's huge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. So Shanta, how about you? You got any stories that you have, have experienced over time that, that you might want to share with us? Oh, you're, I think you're muted, brother. Sorry about that. Uh, it's okay. Sitting, sitting here trying to figure out which one, I mean, among a, a variety of, uh, of stories. 
Well, I think that the one that I want to uh, say doesn't particularly fit the COVID-19 situation or the protests here. My work is in different parts of the world. I'm, uh, it is in Nigeria, in the northeast of Nigeria, where Boko Haram is active. It is in Sri Lanka and it is in Bangladesh. <clears throat> Several of us have connections to those countries. Um, I, um, what we do is we build interfaith peacemaker teams. We bring religious leaders and people of faith together uh, in order that they might both collaborate, build power, and think strategically about local actions that are small enough to win. And as they win those actions, they are able to, uh, uh, to gain more power in order that they might win bigger actions. So that's the, uh, that's the strategy. Today we have 71 interfaith peacemaker teams in uh, Nigeria, 21 in Sri Lanka, and, uh, uh, and 15 in Bangladesh. Um, and in, in each of these situations, we have interreligious communities coming together to address the local situation. The question, the, the story that I like to tell among all of the variety of stories uh, is um, probably coming, with the one that comes out of Sri Lanka, the, you'll probably remember that uh, Easter Sunday of last year, there was a bombing uh, situation. And uh, three churches and three hotels were bombed uh, during that time. And uh, uh, there was an extremist Muslim group that was uh, involved in that. Uh, the, uh, the tensions between Muslims and Hindus and Christians and Buddhists have been very severe for a long time, particularly because there are some extremist Buddhist monks that are rousing up the people, particularly against Muslims and Christians. So this is a very complex situation. The story I want to tell you is about, uh, about a village in uh, the East Coast, uh, south of Batikolo, if you know uh, that town. Um, Nina knows all of this. There's a little village called Peria Nilavane. Uh, Peria Nilavane uh, has, um, uh, has, you know, the whole area has a lot of Muslims. In fact, uh, some of the people who created the problem for the Easter Sunday bombing uh, came out of a town just south of Batiklo. Uh, in Peria Nil Avenue, uh, this young woman um, who, uh, who is our leader there um, wanted to bring Muslims and Hindus together. Um, she is a Christian, but her, her attempt was to bring Muslims and Hindus together that was uh, that were uh, there was enormous tension during that period because of the bombing that that took place and of course all kinds of rumors that go on uh, that are derogatory uh, derogatorily aimed at muslims um, and, and so because of these rumors uh, people don't trust each other so she had a really hard time uh, trying to bring these people together well, when I went there uh, shortly after, uh, maybe three, four months after that bombing, they were in the thick of this tension. Uh, and, uh, and they couldn't even, I asked them to come for a, for a meeting, they, could, they couldn't even sit still for a bit without starting to accuse each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it was that kind of situation that took place. Well, <clears throat> Six to eight months later, when I went out there uh, in February of this year, uh, things had changed substantially. And primarily because of this young leader, uh, her name is Devika. Uh, Devika's uh, uh, work, she had done tremendous work to bring the two groups together so that they might begin to understand and, and learn from each other. How did she do that? by getting them to help each other in their local um, cottage industry work. You know, they, they all do little uh, projects uh, that uh, some have received micro loans to do uh, various kinds of projects. And she figured out a way of getting the Hindus and the Muslims to work together in order to help each other. Suddenly when you're working together with somebody, the stereotypes fall away. It's not even like sitting around and talking. 
it, it, when you actually do something, you build a relationship that is perhaps more, that is perhaps deeper and more long lasting than, uh, than otherwise. And so this time when I went, well, people were talking and they were excited and they wanted to do stuff. And, uh, you, you know, how, how can we, we've done so much, how can we take this to the next level? You know, that's the conversation. Uh, I, I think the, I think the, that's, that's the primary lesson for me in that story. I, my inspiration for that, as you all would probably know this name, a man named Millard Fuller, who uh, wrote a book called The Theology of the Hammer. Millard Fuller is the founder of Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. And Millard Fuller said in that book, when uh, he's talking about Jews and Christians uh, in, that, in that situation, but when a Jew and a Christian would get together and take two by fours and hammer a nail together, that is far better than any dialogue that we might have because they have done something, because they have built a house together. It lasts for a long time. Yes. Um, that's the lesson of the story as well. Shakta, thank you so much. And, and now I'd like to ask you, Elise, if you want to offer a story. Well, I would be happy to pick up from where um, you left off there with the, the theology of the hammer and doing something together. Um, so the work that I do with Faith Action Network is bringing together um, a, a fairly new, only nine years old, which is fairly new in the scheme of things, um, interfaith um, network to do advocacy for social justice, um, both in their local, state, and at the federal level together. And, you know, just finding our common ground and finding the points where we agree on care of neighbor and you know love for each other and to um, create you know more justice in the world um, just gets us so much further down the road and uh, I love the hammering together I really do that love that but so maybe we're hammering out justice in kind of a policy wonky way um, that you can sing it. <laughs> right if I had a hammer um, <laughs> So that's, that's where I come to this work from. Um, I think it was really Paul Knitter um, who first uh, proposed that idea, uh, theologian, who you know, said, we're going to go much further interfaith if we work together, if we get our hands dirty together. So the story, and, and you know, there's no, I'll just tell you about something. I guess that's a story. Um, I have been lucky in my life to attend a couple, only a, a couple um, world events that had interfaith participation. And those really opened my eyes and deepened my commitment. And the first one was the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995, where there was a very strong um, theologian, women theologians track in that. And really good stuff, really great collaboration, theologians and spiritual activists all of, from all over the world. And many of those conversations would be interrupted by women from other parts of the world who said, get your religion out of my politics. Get your, your religion out of the way of my well-being. Um, and both were true, right? There was such beauty and truth, and there was um, interference of religion in their countries and, and in their well-beings. So from that experience, I saw that, you know, spirituality, religion, faith um, has both the ability to annihilate us and to bring us together. And those are really powerful, um, you know, two sides of the equation. The other uh, world event that I feel like really highlighted more the ability to bring us together is the Parliament of World Religions. Um, I've been able to attend the last two. And, and that is just such a beautiful gathering to me of, you know, I believe most every faith represented. Um, and no, no sense of the annihilation, really, coming together with goodwill and to learn from each other. And when I'm in those kinds of um, situations, I just question, how can we not, how can we not um, build a better world? Um, and thank God we have faith. Uh, we have spirituality, we have our traditions to guide us into 
to creating the world we want to be part of. So I'll leave that there. Yeah, thank you, Elise. You know, I a couple of a couple of stories that come to my mind. First, you know, the organization that I'm part of was started because a rabbi who experienced programs in Lithuania where they were shouting in the streets about killing Jewish folk. Um, he, he, re he recognized the anti-Catholic bigotry against uh, uh, that, was, that was coming up during the election of John F. Kennedy. And he realized like the, the potential for, 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 for violence that comes out of that kind of speech and bigotry. And, uh, and so he, he helped put a TV show together, eventually with a, a Roman Catholic priest who in Ireland had experienced a religious discrimination toward Catholics, where they had to actually go out into the forest to be able to, to celebrate mass. And those two formed a really powerful friendship and, and, and really modeled for a lot of people um, how, how we can uh, both be faithful to our tradition, but at the same time, um, experience unity and in, in, in humanity and, and learn from and with others. Um, I, I, I want to share a story uh, about uh, Wilmer, Minnesota, where Nina in her work uh, invited me out uh, to Wilmer, Minnesota. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't thought that there would be much work going on in Wilmer, Minnesota, interfaith-wise. But, but there I, I met, thanks to Nina and Catherine and Shoulder to Shoulder, a young Muslim woman who had been attacked in high school and, and, had, and had a wound, uh, and a uh, physical wound, and, and who together with a young Lutheran woman um, were really leading a movement uh, of unity to overcome some of the white supremacy and the anti-Muslim bigotry that was there in Wilmer. And both of those, those women, so powerful, and, and uh, their relationship was, was incredible. And to see those like 40, 50 people in that in that little uh, community center, you know, learning how to counteract anti-Muslim bigotry um, and how to build their own skills. Like, it just makes you think, you know, whenever you, we, we used to fly in airplanes, you know, but even now we, we still drive around sometimes. And, and in every community we see in every neighborhood, there are people like that working, you know. Um, and the last little story I, I would share here um, comes back to the story of, that, that, that Shanta, you know, shared. Um, a few days after, after that, that terrible uh, tragedy in Sri Lanka, uh, there was a, a, a commemoration um, at the Roman Catholic, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, cathedral in Seattle. And I was pleased to be able to be there sitting next to a, a Sikh leader um, and, and then a Baha'i next to me and then a Buddhist right behind me. And, and then as we went outside um, after the service was over, uh, the Muslim community brought flowers and they, they gave a, bouquet, a small bouquet of flowers to every Christian that was there saying that we're so sorry that that attack happened on the Christian community. And, uh, and it, was, it was so beautiful to be in that space with all those, all those well-intentioned people who were well-intentioned because of their faith tradition and who knew each other from many other activities and efforts. Um, to be able to share that grief, you know, with each other. Um, and and I, I think that, again, that there, there are stories like that in every community. If we could just lift them up and, and just remember, remember them. Um, are, are there any stories anybody else would like to share here uh, for a minute? Any, anything else anyone would like to share? Race? Sure. I, I would be happy to um, share uh, my story in a briefly. Uh, so again, you know, the, the point you just mentioned that we have the human capacity to get beyond our bitter experiences and, um, you know, past uh, mistake, prejudice, intolerance, and we have the capacity to, to, you know, to treat each other as human first, regardless of the past bitter experience. And um, so my yeah. story goes, you know, uh, talks about this point as well that, um, so let me take a step back first that after, uh, as you mentioned, that I served in the Bangladeshi Air Force. So uh, after graduating as a pilot officer from the Bangladesh Air Force, uh, I did not feel my destiny was there. And uh, my American dream kept calling me. Uh, eventually, I left my career, my home, and my family for New York City to pursue additional uh, education, ed uh, additional higher education. Uh, growing up watching Wild Wild West movies, I could not resist 
the invitation to visit Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Excited to see the ranches, cowboys, and bars with the famous swinging doors. Though I never did find one. <laughs> I, I moved to Dallas a few months before 9-11, working in a friend's convenience store by day and working uh, and studying computer science by night. Uh, it did not take me long to realize my life in America would never be the same. Ten days after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, as I stood behind uh, the counter, a man walked in holding a double barrel shotgun, pointing at my face directly. And he asked, where are you from? And before I could say anything more than excuse me, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. On my way to the hospital, I promised God that if you let me live, I would do good things with my life. What happened as a result of this shooting, I underwent several eye surgeries. Unfortunately though, I lost vision in one eye. The right side of my face and skull was and remains peppered more than three dozen bullet fragments. And uh, I lost my job, my home, my sense of security and my fiance, but gained more than $60,000 in medical bills. And you know, there is not a single day that goes by that I am not reminded of my, of this painful tragedy, but I continue to make peace with my pain. And uh, my shooter, Mark Stroman, killed two South Asian men, one from India and one from Pakistan during his 9-11 retaliation shooting spree. And he claimed he was hunting Arabs, but not one of his uh, victims was Middle Eastern. And after his arrest, he told the news media that what he had done, most Americans wanted to do, they just didn't have the guts. He claimed that he was a true American, he was a patriot, and he blamed me and my kind for 9-11. Mark was uh, tried and was sentenced to death by a little injection. Um, though I had forgiven Mark after I got my life back, it, it wasn't until I was in Mecca for the pilgrimage that I began reflecting uh, back on my shooting and my would-be killer sitting on death row waiting to die. And I imagined myself in his situation. And uh, I, instead of hating him, I saw him as a human being like me. I saw him not just a killer. I saw him as a victim too. I felt that I, I suffered terribly, but I did not see any value in him suffering as well. My faith and my upbringing gave me the courage not only to forgive Mark, but also fight to the save the life of the man who tried to end mine. I returned to the US and launched an international campaign, um, including visiting the headquarters of Lundbeck, the lethal injection manufacturer in Denmark, and was able to convince them to urge the governor of Texas not to use their product to kill human beings. And I was surprised that after our visit, Lundbeck announced that they would stop supplying this drug to the US prison wow. that carry out execution. I also went to the US Supreme Court asking for clemency for my attacker. And um, in the meantime, uh, Mark came to know about me and the diverse coalition of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, uh, Christians, and atheists. And that was the most beautiful part that people from all walks of life, they came together and rallied to get him removed from death row. And I was told that he was stunned and deeply touched by our efforts. And he called me brother in a phone conversation. And uh, he hated me when he didn't know me, but in the end, said he loved me. So you see that forgiveness and um, kindness had a tremendous effect on my attacker. And I would say not only him, but also uh, on his family members who came forward to meet me later and who now treats me as one of their family members. And um, so though Mark, you know, um, 
suffered from tremendous childhood abuse and trauma, a lack of love, education, guidance, living much of his life uh, embroiled in ignorance, hate, and violence, he actually ended his life in peace, receiving love, kindness, and mercy from the very people he once hated, renewing his faith in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and in humanity. His last words were before he was executed, hate is going on everywhere. It has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. And he was executed in 2011. And um, I didn't stop there. I started the nonprofit called World Without Hate. And I share my story um, locally, nationally, and internationally in hopes of inspiring people to get beyond the prejudice, ignorance, intolerance, hate, and violence, and, and treat people as human force, regardless of who they are, where they came from. Because that is our first identity. We all are human beings. We all are God's children. Grace, thank you so much. And and I'm just i am so inspired by your by your, your story and, and and as well as that just that, that simple part of the story where we're going to Mecca for, for your um, your pilgrimage and, and how powerful a moment that was for you where, where you saw that the, the, the core of your faith, the core of, of, of the of the Islamic tradition, you know, is is to forgive. Uh, and, and to do good to those that, that, that harm, you know, us. And I'm, I'm just so touched by that. And I, I, I wonder now, I didn't bring this question up to all y'all, but um, do we have other, first of all, do we have other stories of, of, of forgiveness like that? And what is it about that, the, the, the spiritual traditions, the wisdom traditions you know, that offer us a path toward that? Um, so I'm just going to open that up to any of you that want to want to speak. Nina, how about you? <laughs> sure. You know, there's so many thoughts that are coming to mind. Um, I was raised in a Catholic family um, and uh, Sri Lankan immigrant parents. And, and though, you know, I'll never, you know, fully understand what it means to be black or indigenous or Muslim. I work for this organization, Shoulder to Shoulder, addressing anti-Muslim discrimination. Um, I, I do know what it feels like to be made to feel like you don't belong. Um, and, and, and that is, um, you know, something that so many of our, com our communities, our brothers and sisters are facing. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think about from my Catholic upbringing, you know, we were just talking about theology of the hammer. I I'm thinking about St. Francis, um, who was my confirmation saint, um, and, 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 uh, a quote, you know, we should seek not so much to pray, but to become prayer. And, and what does that mean to become prayer um, in our lives and in the work that we do? Um, and I think about, you know, I learned about this, um, this story, this true story um, in, in history, with the, this relationship between uh, St. Francis and the Sultan, um, al Kamil um, during the height of the Crusades, um, these two leaders met um, and had a relationship. And uh, it, 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 in the midst of the, the war, um, you know, there was a lot of hatred, a lot of uh, misinformation being spread about uh, the Muslim community in particular. Um, uh, there was a moment where uh, they, the crusaders were dying from starvation. There was a flooding of the Nile um, and the army was trapped. There was 50,000 people. Um, and, 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 you know, based on this relationship that they had formed and this friendship and, and the compassion um, uh, drawn upon the Sultan's faith, um, he, he, he offered food um, to the people and essentially saved them. Um, and, and, and this was the impetus um, to the end of the war, the end of the, the long, long war. And it, it's, it's incredible what we can do. And that's, that's, a, that's a story on a very large scale. Um, but there are so many stories of, of just small relationships being built, um, uh, individual relationships that are being built around the country. You know, I think about St. Cloud, Minnesota. There are, um, you know, now that 
we're, we're going virtual. There are, um, you know, culture sharing sessions and story sharing sessions that are happening uh, between the, the mostly Christian community and a Somali Muslim uh, community um, in some of those spheres. Um, there are, you know, um, folks standing up against um, hate crimes and saying, you know, hate has no home here. Um, we are stronger together as a community united. Um, there are, you know, unique uh, uh, kind of creative solutions being formed. Um, there was a story with uh, ICNA Relief, uh, it's a Muslim relief organization working on a variety of issues, including uh, addressing hunger. They have food banks all over the country. And, you know, there was a moment in time where there was no toilet paper or flour in the grocery stores. And um, there was a need for flour in one of their food pantries. And um, it was through their relationships with a local Presbyterian church that ended up providing the flour. And then together they solved this problem to be able to feed the hungry in their community. Um, and so it's, it's, it's so many of, of these, these, these stories that make an impact and can really change the, the harmful narratives uh, that we are hearing. Thank you, Nina. And I just want to say if anybody has any questions on Zoom or on Facebook, uh, just be sure and type those in and we'll, we'll try to get those questions uh, you know, answered it. You know, one of the one of the stories that I that I just like to share briefly is is of uh, someone I work with quite a bit and many of us know, which is who is Sister Anila, you know, Afzali, you know, who is a Harvard trained lawyer and was a, was a partner in a law firm at a very early age and, and could could be making, you know, some major bank right now. You know, but uh, had a spiritual transformation and began to see how um, anti-Muslim hate groups were not only uh, causing pain and, and for for Muslims, but for the people who were feeling the hate, and and for those that uh, you know in the Jewish community and in and other communities that that are impacted when someone starts to go down the road of hate. And uh, it's been such an amazing journey to, to, to watch her engage so many different communities that are under pressure and, and to see her deep religious commitment, you know, not simply as, a, as something that's good in and of itself, which it is, but to see it as a gateway and as a, a source of strength uh, for how she recognizes the human beings in, in other people. And I, I've learned so much from her and from her willingness to, to change her career and just like go a completely different direction. And, uh, and, and to watch her, I remember one, one powerful symbol uh, uh, during 2017, there was a, uh, uh, there was a, uh, or 2016, there was a, a big protest in Seattle. I'm sorry, 2017. And, uh, and this woman uh, was in a wheelchair and had this sign uh, on, on her lap an anti-Muslim, you know, sign. And Anila just uh, was sitting at an Ask a Muslim booth and Anila just kneeled down and, and talked with her and engaged with her. And you could see the woman change in that conversation. And this, this goes back to something that I think all of you have said in one way or another, that, that it's easy to hate someone when we don't know them. It's much harder to hate when we begin to know. Um, and, I, and I've learned from Shanta, you know, that that knowing about another faith is a good thing, knowing a person of another, another wisdom tradition is, is more powerful, but then beginning to work together with them, you know, is just a whole other level. And I think, you know, all of you tonight you know, represent organizations and, and, and in the work that you do, help people, you know, follow that path of knowing and, and getting to know people uh, individually and then beginning to do work together. Um, so um, th does anybody else have a little thought or a short story they'd like to share here before I ask you another question? I can share a small, uh, just, you know, short story. I, I was flying from uh, Seattle to Philly on a red eye flight. And um, I was already upset because I got a middle seat all the way back. But then I, all, I'm always an optimistic person. So I said, I'm gonna make the best use of this middle seat in the red-eye flight all the way back. So uh, when I got my seat, then I saw um, a lady uh, shorter than me approached. Uh, looks like she needs some help to put her luggage in the overhead bin. So I said, can I help you? And she kind of like gave me a look as if yes or no, I'm not sure. Then I said, I don't charge. And it, it, it cracked her up right there. She said, sure. 
So I helped her with the luggage and then she sat next to me and she said, you're too funny. I said, was it too tough to put a smile on your face? She said, of course not. I said, no, I'm glad that you were smiling. So she shared um, chewing gum and said, would you mind? I said, of course not. My mom taught me when people share something, take it. Even if you don't have the intention to eat it right there, but take it as a courtesy and then do whatever you do next later. So I did that. And then she was very friendly and she, she told me that I just came from Jordan and Israel and um, would you like to see some photos? I said, wow, this stranger now would like to show her pictures uh, that from overseas. So we were watching and then she said, what is your faith? I said, I'm a Muslim. And I asked her, what do you know about Islam and Muslim? She said, oh, you guys are supposed to kill or convert to go to heaven. So I didn't take it personally. I just gave a smile and I said, how do you know this and where do you know all this from? She said, it's everywhere. It's from internet, from journal, news media, everywhere. I said, have you ever met one before? She said, not really. I said, welcome to this flight. You're sitting one of them. You are sitting next to one of them in a red eye flight. <laughs> so I joked and I said, you know, like, you know, jokingly. And then we, we connected. We had a very good discussion for almost half an hour. And I said, if that is true, that a Muslim is supposed to go to heaven by killing or converting a person from the other faith, then I should be the happiest person in this world because a person from Christian faith was supposed to be executed on my name. So instead of saving, fighting to save his life, I should be throwing party that I got a passport to go to heaven. But I did the opposite because my faith did not teach me that. My faith taught me to show humanity, show, show, show forgiveness. And I, I shared my story very briefly. And we bonded pretty strongly right there. And we took a nap for a few hours. Once you wake up in the morning, um, she said, I never read a Quran, but you inspired me. I'm going to read one. And uh, how can I visit a mosque? Do I have to ask a permission? She said, no, you just walk into any mosque. Just tell them I'm here to visit. And you can read Quran that way. I read Bible. I read Torah for my own knowledge, for my own sake. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can be more knowledgeable. You can understand the other faith better by reading their spiritual, not by this, uh, scriptures. So from strangers, we connected very positively. And the ignorance, the fear she had before meeting me, it was already gone. And she said, once I go back, I will visit a mosque and I read Quran and I will tell all my congregation that I met a Muslim in a red eye flight. And we all survived and we all <laughs> went to our destination successfully. So, so right now, you know, we, we're, we're awash in, in, in uh, a lot of hard stories. And I, I think the hard stories are important, you know, for us, you know, um, the story about, you know, George Floyd and so many other people. It's important for us to hear those, those difficult stories and, and begin to, to work through some of the denial about the way structural institutional racism has, has impacted everyone, but especially people of color in the country. But I, I, I think there's, there's also a tendency, as, as I said before, in the news media, to kind of only focus on on the negative and, and and sometimes to focus on the stories in a way that doesn't really analyze the roots of things. Um, so, but there are people out there, I think tonight, you know, listening who, who may be feeling, you know, is there, or wondering if there's any hope for the human race. And, uh, and I guess I, I'm just wondering tonight what, what you, uh, you four wise people would say to folk if they're, starting to wonder a little bit if there's any hope for us. Who'd like to go first? Elise? So just picking up on where we've been and where we, you want us to go, I guess I've reflected a lot during this COVID and, um, well, time of two pandemics, as we say, um, you know, just systemic um, racism rearing its ugly head once again. Um, it's always been there, but but in a in a bigger way. And COVID nineteen, um, I've just done a lot of pondering of history. Really, um, I've taken some um, comfort, I guess, in historical fiction, in in just looking backwards to all the places we've been before. And what struck me is that we have been in horrible places before, and. Um, we didn't always, not everybody fared very well through those times, but um, 
I, I'm, I'm struck by, I think it's um, Valerie Kaur who speaks of revolutionary love. And I think that is key to me of this forgiveness. And, and I even like, because I spent a lot of time in this room lately with these books, I picked up this very old book, Revolutionary Forgiveness, which was reflections from a group of people who went to Central America and said, how do we build, rebuild lives? How, how do communities rebuild their lives after going through a civil war? Um, and I think that story can be told over and over in every country of, of Central America and many other countries, of course. Um, but we're at a time, I feel, where the divisions are so deep that we need to go back and look at when you know, South Africa had to figure out how to move forward after apartheid. You know, how do we get to that revolutionary love that can lead to revolutionary forgiveness and uh, rebuild lives? So Thank I you. think we have a lot of great wisdom sources of people who've been through it before. It'll be Thank different, you. but. Yeah, Shanta, what would you say to someone who's feeling a loss of hope right now? Oh, I think you're muted. You're, you're muted there, brother. I think they need to look at the protests that are going on. I think that's where the hope is. And the hope is not in the churches or mosques. Or okay, we, we, know Shanta's been, we know Shanta's been having some, some internet issues today. So Shanta, start, start over again. That'll be just fine. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the hope is in the protests that are going on. And in the protests, we are, we are discovering that, uh, that it is the young people who are leading us to the place of hope. It is really not the churches or synagogues or mosques or any other religious institutions, but it is the, the, the ones that are determined to make a difference in this world. Hope is not just something that comes out of the air. It comes out of hard work. It, it comes out of putting your, as I like to say, strapping your feet to your feet and, uh, and, and, and walking and marching and agitating. That's, that's how it happens. So I take a lot of hope from, from the uh, be directed, uh, guided in some, in some ways. So Shanta's email or, or internet is continuing to, to, to give him some trouble. Uh, Nina, yeah, I wonder what you would say. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm so, uh, you know, I, I totally uh, agree with all that has been said. Um, and I'll add, you mentioned um, uh, Valerie Carr, um, Elise, earlier. Um, and actually, I, I, this was not planned, but today she um, uh, uh, released her new book, See No Stranger. Today is that day that it's coming out. Um, um, and, and, and really, I, I do want to draw upon some of her words um, that she um, shared just after the 2016 elections. Um, she said, you know, what if this darkness that we're experiencing, the darkness of xenophobia, racism, um, you know, discrimination, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-black, you know, you, you name it, uh, the darkness that we're seeing um, in this society, um, what if it's not just the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? And I just love that image, especially now being pregnant myself. Um, and, and, and she asks, you know, what is the midwife? What is the wisdom of the midwife? Um, uh, the midwife says to breathe first. So let's breathe together. Let us center. Let us uh, educate ourselves. Uh, take responsibility and onus and ownership of, of, you know, the shape of our society. Um, and then we push. And, and we birth a new future. Um, and that, it, that, that imagery um, is so beautiful. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about, unfortunately, we've been through such a long labor and, and does it feel like it will ever end? And, and you know, I, 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 I can't see, um, you yeah. know, the future ahead, but I do see so much beauty now in the present um, of people coming together and pushing 
and and marching um, and educating themselves and and speaking out against anti-Muslim policies or anti-Black policies or you know anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, you know what whatever um, that we're seeing, and and that is so beautiful to see um, in this long labor that we're in. Grace, brother, what do you how, what do you want to share to someone who's feeling a loss of hope right now? Well, you know, uh, as a very optimistic person, um, I will I will share what I did in in my darkest time in my life and how I was able to, you know, uh, get my life back on track from the rock bottom situation and how I was able to, you know, choose the path of empathy and forgiveness and which helped me and my attacker, you know, um, to move forward and also uh, get beyond our bitter experiences. So. Um, hope is one thing, but in order to make change, we have to combine action with hope. Merely hope will not, you know, give us the change that we look for. So, in a situation, you know, in a in a uh, in a hard situation, how can we stay? You know, how can we find hope and remain optimistic? So, what I did, I I deeply thought about about the people, you know, uh, who had harder life than me. Thank God I got my life back. I was blinded only one eye, but I thought about it could have been worse. I could have blinded in two eyes. I could have brain damage. It could have been worse in many, many ways. So I, I thought about that. It's not all bad. Yes, I've been, I'm going to now some, you know, um, pretty tough time in all aspects, mentally, physically, psychologically, financially, but there are people who are worse situation than mine. So I thought about the people, you know, uh, who had a harder life. It helped me a lot. Um, I trusted. Um, I did not lose my hope, my faith, and my dreams, um, and my faith in God. I trusted uh, that things will get better uh, today or tomorrow, and um, I I focused on uh, blessings, not only on the issues, only on the you know pain and suffering. I thought about that I'm still alive. I have education. And I'm in the greatest country in the world, in America, and there is a system that works if you want to make a change in your life. And um, then, and people came into my life who helped me a lot. So I, I focused on the blessings as well. And um, I, I did my best to stay positive and look for positive in every situation. It was very painful, but I always kept myself um, in a way for finding the positive things. And what I did, I also made a short-term goal and long-term goal to get beyond you know, uh, the, you know, the pain and suffering. So I went back to school. I started working in restaurants for $2.13 per hour. It, it gave me an opportunity to overcome my fear and, and ignorance and get to know more about people, about American culture. So it was a short-term goal to get beyond you know, the uh, pain and suffering and the fear. It helped me to achieve my longer long-term goal as well to get into the IT and, and American corporate. So, I mean, to summarize, uh, I mean, to summarize it, that um, when you step positive, um, you know, think about other people who could be in a in a, in a more, much harder shape, and also um, read something positive, watch a documentary, uplifting, inspiring documentary, film, you know, um, or read about your your heroes or about you know the people you you know, uh, see as a role model, read their, you know, about their life history, how they were able to successful and how they were resilient in their lives. So that helps a lot. And at the same time, we need to find ways to, you know, uh, forgive each other, you know, the people who hurt us in the past or who are causing any kind of, you know, uh, pain and suffering to us. We need to find ways to forgive them and uh, let them know that I forgave you and uh, I'm trying to move forward and you do the same thing uh, to me as well. So if we forgive each other, it will help us to get beyond our bitter experience, and it will help us to, to you know, um, to build a you know a one united and peaceful country for all of us. You know, I, I find myself, of course, as a Christian and Christian pastor, uh, you know, inspired by Jesus. You know, whose stump speech was, uh, you know, the time is now. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. The reign of God. Or uh, the way I would say it is God's way of mutuality, of living with living in mutual respect, is come near, and and so there was there was both hope and there was also hard work in it, 
And, and during this last year, I've been part of a group in Anacortes working um, uh, for equity, racial equity in Anacortes after a noose was, was hung in a, in, a, in a city park. A clear message to all the people of color in our town. And uh, included in that group, you know, we have Asian Americans and African Americans and people who are LGBTQ and, um, and, and, you know, folk of the whole, you know, all the hues, as, as some of our members like to say. And, and one of them is a Native American woman who, who said, after all that's happened to my people, what, what I really want, what, our, what we really want is to find a way to live together because we're all here now. And if I can see hope amongst people of color, people who've experienced institutional and structural and interpersonal bigotry, um, who've gone through so much, and if, if they can have hope, if, if they can, can long for a, a way for us to live with each other, then really, who am I to not feel hope? Who, who am I not at least, even if I don't feel it, to act out of that? And, and, and that, that hope for a better way for human beings to live is at the heart of, I think, all the Abrahamic traditions so that we can learn to be a blessing uh, to all the nations of the world, all the families of the world. And that, that that's really God's mission statement is to be a blessing to all the different families of the world. And so therefore that's, that's kind of our mission statement too. And so when I, when I get down, as I have been down this last week or so, I think, um, I think about those those friends of mine who've experienced far more of the terror than I have and their hope. And I, and I think back to uh, the great leaders of the Abrahamic tradition, Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, who all faced terrible situations and who, who knew, he, you know, Moses had to go back to Egypt and Jesus had to go to Jerusalem and, and, and Moses or, and, and Muhammad um, had, had to try to lead a different vision for how to be human in, in, a, in a time of oppression in Mecca. So there's just so many stories like that, I think, that we can draw from and, 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 and find new hope. And as you said, Race, I think as all of you said, find new hope in action with our walking boots on. So um, with, with that, I, I think we're, we're getting close to the end of our time. And I just want to thank all of you. I know uh, Shanta, his internet's kind of bad, so he's, he's sort of dropped out here, but we're so thankful to Shanta and to Nina and to Elise and to Race. Uh, thank you all for being on the program tonight. I, I want to let everybody know that uh, you can find out more about our organization at pathstounderstanding.org. Be sure and check out Challenge 2.0, hosted by Jeff Renner on our YouTube channel. And we're launching a new podcast series with all of our, all the audio from all of our Challenge 2.0 programs, as well as wisdom from our neighborhoods. Uh, we encourage you as well to check out our Facts Over Fear campaign, which is countering anti-Muslim bigotry uh, during this, this time of COVID uh, and in this election year. And I just encourage all of you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Terry. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Nina.